I'm Alex Wolf from Information Week, and today we're going to talk about Intel's exciting new Core i7 architecture. I'm also going to talk a little bit about what Intel and AMD are doing with their desktop and server processor lines to bring them to an exciting new technology called 32 nanometer. And I have a couple of other goodies for you. We're also going to talk about solid state flash drives, and I'm going to show you the, the, the cooling, the cooling, um, the heat sink that you need to, uh, to cool this thing. It's, uh, it's kind of interesting. It's a very interesting time. Uh, amid the recession, there's a lot of technology development going on. Let's get started with some demos. Solid state drives are the flash based substitutes for mechanical hard drives that are taking the computer world by storm. The great thing about these is they're super fast and they're immune to environmental factors. They don't lose data when you ding them and they're pretty resistant to uh, hot and cold. On the downside, they're extremely expensive. This drive that I have here, which is one of the cutting edge examples, it's the Intel X25 and it's got 80 gigab gigabytes. 80 gigs is pretty small, right? Yet this costs 500 bucks. On the downside also, they have a limited number of write cycles, which is counterintuitive considering that you would think a solid state uh, device would last forever. On the plus side, solid state drives are super fast in terms of their read cycle, so they're great for putting system software like the operating system on. It will help your PC, your laptop run faster. On the downside, as I said, they're very expensive and also, paradoxically, they have a limited number of write cycles. Lots of companies are making solid state drives. Intel, SanDisk, Samsung, Hitachi, a lot of lesser known companies. And the great thing is now a lot of the laptops are starting to come out with SSD as an option. Famously, Apple with its MacBook Air last year came out with an SSD option. And a lot of the newer netbooks are coming out with SSDs, which sort of completes the faster, smaller, lighter picture when you put an SSD into a, an ultralight or a netbook. Again, on the downside, maybe ultralight in terms of form factor, but not in terms of price. Our other demo for the day is Intel's newest desktop board, the DX58SO. And you know what? I shouldn't even really open this. You see this caution? Caution. If I'm electrostatic, this is a problem. But this is the board for Intel's new Core i7 part. That's their super fast 45 nanometer quad core. This is the first time, this re review unit, this is the first time I've ever seen it where the chip is pre-installed. I guess this thing is so high-end, they don't even trust me to put this in. It's got four banks of DDR3 memory. Um, this is a pretty compact motherboard. One thing you don't see is the amount of cooling required. Let me show you that. These things generate a lot of heat a lot of heat. This is a thermal right and you will this will be unbelievable when you see how big this heat sink is. Taking it out of the package here. This is like you would think this does this look like a uh, a grill on a 69 Corvette. So these things give off a lot of heat. The point I want to make about these chips now is it is what interests me and what I've been writing about is it's sort of the zen of chips. Now, chip processing power is essentially, MIPS are free. Processing power is ubiquitous, it's free. On the other hand, chips like these are expensive. Well, the high end of the line costs 1100 You can get a competitive Core i7 processor for under $250. So if you're, a, if you're doing any video editing at home or anything which requires um, some processing power, you would do well to get this kind of thing. So the other interesting thing now is we are headed, Moore's Law continues, Moore's Law, uh, Gordon Moore, one of the co-founders of Intel, postulated in 1965 that the, the processing power would double every 18 months, or the number of gates you could put on a given slice of silicon would double 18 months. That has borne true, that has held for the past 40 years. Notwithstanding the fact that we have several times come to sort of an end of day scenario 
to the chip world where the feature sizes on these microprocessors have gotten so small that it's been thought that engineers could not continue to pack more gates onto them. So they've done, they've had to do some tricks. Intel, for example, has gone to a high K dielectric, which is a new type of material which eliminates a problem called leakage current. Leakage is when you have the features too close together, it doesn't work just it doesn't work quite right. Current leaks out of the gates. Also, the industry, Intel and AMD in 2005, they had to stop uh, pushing the clock speed forward because the power dissipation was getting too high. These chips were throwing off too much wattage and becoming impossible to cool. So they had to go to a dual and quad core scenario so that they could essentially bifurcate, split the processing into different areas and rein in the um, power dissipation envelope. I'm oversimplifying, of course, but the key point I'm trying to make is the roadmap where we go ever forward of increased processing power has continued unabated for 40 years, over 40 years, and it's continuing now. Now let's talk about feature size. Feature size, again, is the, is the microscopic width of the smaller features on the chip. It's progressed from 130 nanometers to 64, 45. We're at 45 nanometers now. That's the current generation. Intel has been out for about a year. AMD has already released, uh, is just releasing its 45 nanometer parts. And Intel has had 45 nanometer parts for about a year. AMD also has 45 nanometer parts and its Opteron server chip line, its Phenom desktop processor family. And it is, it is amazing the number of um, transistors you can pack onto a microprocessor. Moving forward, next year in 2010, we should see 32 nanometers. That will increase processing power um, even more. So to close, again, we're, we're at, this is the golden age of processing. And the other point is, my, my idea about the zen of processing, is you see processing now is moving into the cloud. It's, it's so cheap, it's ubiquitous. So on the one hand, you, you're really not paying, you don't have to pay a premium for processing power anymore. You can get it, you can own it, you can consolidate your servers, you can go get it in the cloud. It's almost like the gating factors now are where are you going to have your app? Are you going to host it and have to pay for a license fee and have to pay for ma maintaining it and having IT people to diagnose problems? Or are you going to lease it out, run it in the cloud? And of course, there you have other concerns that people have raised where they're worried about security in the cloud, uptime. So we are at a transitional point now where the whole idea that you have to own all the resources in-house, um, I, I think we're past the point where people can't wrap their arms around it, they can't give that up. We're moving to an era where you're going to have a, a, a mixed modality. People have some stuff in-house, they have computing resources in-house, they also lease a lot of stuff in the cloud. I'm Alex Wolf from Information Week, and this has been a look at this week or month in chips. Thank you.